Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're revisiting the Core i7-8700K, which happens to be an Intel CPU that I'm rather fond of, though it was a bit of a slap in the face for some Core i7 owners. And that's because less than 12 months after the release of the 7700K, Intel pushed out the 8700K, offering 50% more cores on an incompatible platform for roughly the same price. Basically, if you bought a 7700K upon release, or any time before October of 2017, you were in for a bit of a shafting once the 8700K dropped for the first time in just over half a decade. Just over half a decade for the first time, Intel was finally upgrading their flagship Core i7 range from four cores with eight threads, so quad cores with hyper-threading to six cores with 12 threads. And while that might sound like a bit of a trivial upgrade given what we have today, 8-core, 10-core, 12-core, and even 16-core desktop CPUs, at the time it was a big deal, and in many ways still is. And that's because after six years of quad cores, the industry has started to finally move on and games are benefiting from more cores. And that also means games can suffer poor performance when limited to just four cores. It also meant for less than a 10% increase in price, Intel was now offering 50% more cores. And again, this all happened in the same year, which is why I called the 7700K the worst CPU purchase of 2017. Actually, it wasn't necessarily the worst, it was just amongst the worst. Intel had a few bangers that year. So this all sounds a bit anti-Intel, but in fact, it's really not. They were just rising to the competition. Sure, you could argue that they should have made those moves a little earlier on, perhaps a few years earlier on than they ultimately did, which would have made Ryzen splash onto the scene more of a, a drop, a, a little trickle, not, not as splashy. Anyway, they didn't, and what we ended up with was a rushed 8th gen series with two more cores tacked onto the high end. The results though were very impressive. The 7700K was already a gaming beast, but with two more cores, the 8700K was set to retain that title for a much longer period. From day one, in a day one review, I called it the king of gaming, and although it was technically superseded by the 9900K and then the 10900K, it's still a very capable gaming processor even today, I doubt you'll be feeling the need to upgrade anytime soon. That's because the new Core i5-10600K, a part which we feel is the best value option for high refresh rate gamers right now, shares its specifications with the 8700K. The 10600K is clocked more aggressively out of the box, but both are unlocked parts that typically hit similar clock speeds once overclocked. The 10600K is also $100 cheaper, but it was released roughly two and a half years later, so I'd say 8700K owners have got their money's worth in that time. Anyway, to see how the 8700K handles in 2020, the 8th gen processor has been tested on the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Ultra and the new 10th gen Intel Core series on the ASUS ROG Maximus 12 Extreme. Then all the Ryzen processors have been tested on the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master. Finally, all configurations feature a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti graphics card, 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200CL14 memory, and a Corsair Hydro Series H150i Pro 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's get into the results. As usual, we'll start with the Cinebench R20 multi-core results, and as you'd expect, the 8700K with 50% more cores is almost 50% faster than the 7700K. Out of the box, we're looking at a 45% performance increase, and then once overclocked, that margin does reach 50%, as our 8700K clocks to 5 GHz much more easily. We also see that overclocked, the 8700K is roughly on par with the Ryzen 7 2700X, so a very solid result for the 6-core processor. Of course, though, as you'd expect, the newer third-gen Ryzen series does fare better. Single-core performance is roughly on par with the 7700K, and with both overclocked to a similar frequency, the OC results are also much the same. Here we're seeing just over a 40% improvement in compression performance with the 7-zip file manager, so we're seeing another significant performance uplift within the same year of the 7700K's release. The decompression margins are similar, here the 8700K was 37% faster out of the box, and when overclocked to 5GHz couldn't quite catch the Ryzen 5 3600 in this workload. Performance in Blender was boosted by 46%, it's actually a 32% reduction in render time making it 46% faster. These percentages often confuse people when slower is better, and I tend to go with faster being 46% here as it's in line with the higher is better percentages. So please keep that in mind as we continue to look at the rest of the results. For code compilation work, the 8700K is just shy of 40% faster than the 7700K, and that actually made it slower than the Ryzen 5 3600, even once overclocked to five gigahertz. 
That said, when compared to the Ryzen 5 2600, it was a good bit faster. The 8th Gen Core i7 processor delivered excellent results in DaVinci Resolve Studio 16, and while there are certainly faster options available today, it has aged very well here. The same is also true for the Adobe Premiere Pro 2020 results. Stock we're looking at Ryzen 5 2600 Lite performance, while overclocked it was able to match the stock R5 3600, so not bad given its age. The Adobe Photoshop 2020 performance is also very respectable, and the stock 8700K was able to match the Ryzen 7 2700X. Adobe After Effects 2020 mostly relies on single core performance, though the extra cores of the 8700K do give it a small performance advantage over the 7700K, but as this application predominantly just uses a few cores, the overclocked 8700K scores very well. Given that the 8700K is of course a 14 nanometer processor running at an aggressive clock speed, the power consumption figures are actually very good. Of course overclocked it is quite a power pig, but even so we're talking about total system consumption south of 300 watts, so it's really not that bad. Now it's time to look at some gaming performance and we'll start with Battlefield 5 which has been tested at 1080p using the ultra quality preset with an RTX 2080 Ti. Remarkably, we see an almost 30% improvement in 1% low performance when comparing the stock performance between the 8700K and 7700K. Then once overclocked, that margin increases to 37%. So clearly, as games become more CPU demanding, the 8700K will become considerably faster than the 7700K, and more importantly, will be able to provide a smooth gaming experience. Even in Far Cry New Dawn, which we don't really think of as a core heavy title, it does see some benefit from the 6 core 8700K, and with both parts overclocked, the 8700K is up to 22% faster. Here we're only seeing around a 10% gain when comparing the 7th and 8th gen Core i7 processors and Gears Tactics, and we're also seeing the 8700K match the new Core i9 10900K once overclocked to 5GHz. So that is obviously a very impressive result, and it proves why it's still one of the best gaming CPUs. Ghost Recon Breakpoint isn't very CPU sensitive, so we're looking at pretty similar performance across the board, particularly with the Intel CPUs, and again, the 8700K performs exceptionally well. Okay, so as usual, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, like Battlefield 5, provides very telling results, and it gives us a clear indication of where things are heading. Stock, we're seeing a 21% increase in frame rate from the 7700K to the 8700K, and that's obviously a significant increase given the CPUs are based on the same design. The stock 8700K is also on par with the Ryzen 5 3600, and this is how I expect these processors to compare in future demanding titles. Last up, we have Red Dead Redemption 2, and here we're seeing up to an 18% performance advantage in favor of the 8700K over the 7700K when comparing the stock out-of-the-box performance. The 8700K is also comparable in this title with the newer and more expensive Intel processors such as the 10700K and 10900K. As you might have expected, 2017's King of Gaming is still a very capable gamer, Though I suppose at one point the 7700K was also 2017's King of Gaming, but it had to relinquish that title before year's end, as I've already discussed in detail. As we've seen, thanks to those extra cores, the 8700K has unsurprisingly aged much better, and should continue to age much better than its quad-core predecessor. While piecing this content together, I went back and watched my original 8700K review to see what I actually said about the CPU when I first reviewed it, and I found the conclusion quite interesting given how this has all played out over the past few years, and here is the bulk of that conclusion. Intel's new mainstream flagship Core i7 is a beast. For gamers seeking the ultimate solution, there is simply nothing better than the Core i7 8700K. It has no weaknesses. Out of the box performance is incredible, overclocking is even more incredible, and as a result, it's going to find its way into my new gaming rig. Gaming aside though, what about productivity? Compared to the Ryzen 7 1700, the 8700K is at best on par in terms of value, but with both overclocked to the max, the Ryzen 7 has a little more to give. Even so, it will vary from one application to the next, and I'd say overall they are quite similar. Again, those on a budget will opt for Ryzen as it is cheaper and will deliver similar performance without much trouble. Still, the 8700K has proven to be much more of an all-rounder than the 7700K ever was. Overall, I really like Intel's new Core i7 8700K. 
So a positive review then. And I think if you did pull the trigger on an 8700K, you'll be looking back thinking you made the right choice especially if gaming's the priority. Of course, AMD did make the choice a little bit harder with the second gen Ryzen series, especially with discounts that saw parts such as the Ryzen 7 2700 selling for almost $100 US less than its original MSRP. But again, for high refresh rate gaming, Intel's been the more obvious choice and the Core i5-10600K certainly does continue that trend today. And that is gonna do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. That's all I'm going to say. If you'd like to support this work and all the work we do on the channel, then check out our Patreon account. You also become part of the Harbour Box community, get some really cool perks, live streams. What else have we got? We've got an exclusive Discord server for Patreon members. Tim and myself are active on there. You can ping us at any time. Q&As, behind the scenes video. Anyway, if you're interested, link for that is in the video description. Feel free to check it out. But other than that, thank you very much for watching the entire video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.